Welcome to uh, Minor Prophets with a major message. Today we're going to be looking at the prophet Haggai in the book of Haggai. Uh, it's very short. You, it's very hard to even find in the Bible if you're doing that flick thing with your fingers uh, through the Bible because it's only two chapters. Haggai uh, is a prophet who prophesied in the year 520 uh, BCE or BC, however you uh, want to say that. Um, and <clears throat> something that's important to understand is with, uh, with minor prophets especially, they fit into the stories uh, found elsewhere in the Bible. And so it's, it's not just all chronological. So you have the books in the Bible with, well, here you have this, and then this happens, and this happens. They're all kind of intertwined at some point, especially after you get past the books of the law. And, uh, and, and, and after uh, even uh, um, Samuel, you, you, you have uh, different stories that intertwine and interconnect. Um, so here you see where this, the story of Haggai or the book of Haggai interconnects with Ezra and Zechariah. Ezra is uh, Ezra Nehemiah is really one one book but broken into two uh, and Ezra the book of Ezra uh, with regards to some of this context is uh, taking you through um, post-exilic uh, Israel and where where they're actually finally leaving exile and, uh, and returning to Judea and so uh, we have here Haggai um, is is inter, interdispersed into this story. So they, they're connected. Uh, and so it's very important to understand this, and, and Zechariah as well. It's very un, important to understand this uh, when you're looking at the context of Haggai. So Haggai is said in post-exilic Judea. Uh, the the um, exile happened. God was not happy with Israel. Um, Israel was split into two after King Solomon and the two kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judea. And, uh, and things just went downhill, especially after that. Uh, the kings bringing in uh, idols and other things and really getting the people away from God. And so uh, this all resulted in the exile of, at the hands of the Babylonians. And, um, and so all the people in, in Israel and Judea were uh, exiled and dispersed everywhere. The temple, which was located in Jerusalem, in Judea, was destroyed by the Babylonians or the Neo-Babylonians. So... Um, here we have uh, the Neo-Babylonians are no longer ruling over this land. It is the Persians who've now taken over. And the king of Persia, Cyrus, uh, makes an edict for to return people who want to go back to the land, uh, Judea, to, to go back to the land and reestablish a temple in Jerusalem. He wanted them to do that. He wanted, uh, he actually sent lots of different peoples back to their lands that were once uh, taken from their lands and uh, sent back to rebuild temples. And, and the, the Jews were one of them. And God had, had moved this particular king to send the, the Jews back and to build his temple again. I mean, that's he used a a non-Jewish person who who uh, wasn't one of his chosen people to to do this, which is really interesting. And so and so the so these these people head back to the land who want to return to the land and rebuild the temple and and reestablish themselves. And Zerubbabel who is uh, of the line of King David. Zerubbabel uh, is made governor of the, the Judean province there. And so, so they will be ruling themselves in a way, governing themselves in that area, the, the Jews. Uh, however, 
it's all under the thumb of Persia. Uh, but it's very important. They want this temple to be built and they want these people to be back into their land. And, and so this has taken place in Judea, in Jerusalem, where the temple is, is built in that area. And it's under the ultimate rule of Persian King Darius the first. Uh, for some reason, the, the, the Jews that returned to the land did not build the temple. They drug it out. They did not, they, they ended up not building it for a while until after Cyrus, during the, the reign of King Darius. And there's a number of different reasons for that uh, that you can list. And in Ezra, it looks like there is, it's because there's some dysfunction and disagreement between um, the remnant that's there and, uh, and, uh, and others, uh, and the Jews who are returning want to build the temple. And, and this kind of gets into where some of the, the, the issues are with Samaritans, that, who will be known as Samaritans in the future. These uh, mixture of Jewish, non-Jewish um, heritage. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason um, <clears throat> that you can read about is that the, the, the land is not necessarily in really good shape. There isn't, it isn't like necessarily abundant resources. And, and so some of those uh, in, in Judea at that time, uh, it didn't lend itself to building necessarily, possibly. That's one of the reasons. See, um, the area of Judea is more of an arid, dry, deserty type area. They have the uh, the Dead Sea in that area, and then above in the actual Israel area, where you would see in the Northern Kingdom, that has the Sea of Galilee. It's very green, um, but but in this particular area, it's, it tends to be drier, and 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 so. That's part of it. And then another part of it is that they were waiting for a Zerubbabel to be the, uh, the face of the rebuilding of the temple, somebody who's not Cyrus or, or this uh, non-Jewish king who's ordering the building of the temple. They wanted it to be under the, um, the purview of uh, someone who's Jewish. This is, this is God doing it, and they don't want the king. So, th so this is delayed this building of the temple. And, um, and so let's take a look and read Ezra chapter six. Now, therefore, we'll start reading at verse six. Now, therefore, uh, Tetanai, governor of the province of Judea, beyond the river, Sh Shethar Bazanai, and you are associates, the governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the, the tribute of the province from beyond the river, and whatever is needed, bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests at Jerusalem require. Let that be given to them day by day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a dunghill. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who shall put a hand to alter this, or to destroy this house of God that is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, Make a decree, let it be done with all diligence. It is very important that the, that the temple get rebuilt according to the Persians. Uh, if anybody gets in their way of, of rebuilding this house, the king of 
Persia himself says that a beam shall be pulled from his house and they will be impaled upon it. It's pretty awful. Um, but it shows the importance uh, of rebuilding the temple and for, those, for the people to be uh, reunited back in Judea again. Uh, this also shows that he is still governing um, that area because anybody who interferes has to answer to him. So even though the, the, um, the Jews have returned to this, this land of Judea and they're supposed to rebuild the temple uh, and they can, they can govern themselves, um, the, they are still ultimately the, the government. They're, a, they're, they're underneath the king of Persia. Now let's read uh, uh, 13 to 18. Um, would somebody like to volunteer to read this? Actually, I'll do it. I'll read this part. <laughs> then according to the word sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shatar, Bo Bozani, and the associates did with the diligence that Darius the king had ordered, and the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. They finished their building by decree of God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artax Artaxerxes king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year the reign of Darius the king. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered dedication, at the dedication of this house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their divisions and the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So um, where Haggai picks up, the, Haggai is um, before the temple is finished, because uh, as, as we'll read um, going forward here, you'll see. Um, we're going to move to Haggai and start reading Haggai, okay? Now we are back, to, Darius is the king, the one who just uh, reaffirmed the edict of Cyrus and who has made an edict himself that this temple must be built and that the people uh, reestablished here. Janet, would you mind, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll read, there's some names in here if you don't feel like it. Would you like to read here? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by, hand, by the hand of Haggai, the prophet of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Do you want me to keep going or? <clears throat> so as you can see here, what, what, is, what is going on? What do, you, what do you see going on here? Is Haggai upset with something? Well, yeah, he seems to be. Because he says, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Yeah, so I think he, he is upset. 
He is upset. Mm -hmm. He is upset. Um, the, the, the temple is not <clears throat> being built. It's laying there in, in shambles still. And yet everybody is working on paneled houses, which are really nice houses. Um, and they're taking care of their own stuff. But, but Haggai makes this statement, um, you know, you've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. Like there is this, uh, you will not be content with anything that you're doing. Nothing, everything that you're doing is in vain right now <clears throat> because of what? The temple not being built. That they're caring for themselves and being selfish before they're, they're putting their, before they're building the temple, which was really important. To the, to the Jewish people. I mean, this is where they came to make their sacrifices. This is where they came to encounter God on an intimate level. This is where the priests uh, lit the lamps. And, and so th th this is where God's glory fills the temple. So, that, so he's, this is very upset about this, that the, the nothing, there's no progress on the temple. All right, um, Janet, can you continue? Sure. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, whoopsies. <laughs> you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? because my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labors. So <clears throat> there is a drought happening right now in the land uh, and why is there a drought because they haven't built the temple they're tending to their own stuff but they haven't rebuilt the temple yet and as i said um before this this land is a very arid there's a lot of arid areas to this land of judea and um and uh, it it's it's kind of deserty they they have certain things that will grow, um, like olive trees and some palm trees, but they need a lot more moisture in this area. They need a lot of rain, and, uh, and they're not getting that, and so they're facing a drought. The ground is no longer bearing um, fruit for them because of their decisions. Janet, can you continue? Sure. Uh, 12. Yes. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of the king, of Darius the king. To give you a little bit more background here, um, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, um, the, the governor of Judah. See, he was made governor of Judah um, because he is a highly respected individual who is of the bloodline of King David. And, and so Zerubbabel, for this temple to be built um, under Zerubbabel is 
uh, prophetic in many ways uh, because of his Davidic lineage. And, and so he's respected by the people and the Lord stirred him up and also stirred up the spirit of the, the high priest at the time, Joshua. And, and, and as a result, what happened? They heeded to Haggai's words from God and they commenced building the temple. So now we're going to read Haggai chapter 2. Ruth, would you mind uh, reading? Sure. Okay. The coming glory of the temple. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace declares the Lord of hosts. Uh, what you're seeing in, in this passage of scripture <clears throat> is that the temple is now built, okay? Um, but he's saying, who saw the previous temple? Because it's been like 70 years, uh, and there are actually still some people around who who saw and experienced the former temple. And this particular temple, it, it pales in comparison, in size, um, in, uh, in aesthetics, um, in many, many ways. Uh, it is a, if you were to compare them physically, it, the new temple is a major, major disappointment. And so, and so God is saying here, um, you know, the, that it is not what the men have done, you know, in building this, it's making this temple great. Um, it's what God will do. God himself will bring the glory to this temple. Everything in it is his. And, um, and so uh, he will make it even greater than the previous temple. Even though, it, even though they're looking at it right now, like with disappointment, okay, it's done. And that's one of the reasons why they might have hesitated. This isn't going to be as great as the previous temple um, by any stretch of the imagination. But here God is saying that, um, you know, be encouraged. He's encouraging, be encouraged that even though this does not seem to be anywhere near as good as the previous temple, through me, it will be. Would you like to continue, Ruth? Sure. You're doing a great job reading. Oh, well, you, have well, a good, you have a great reading voice. Oh, well, you I don't know that. about that. Thank you. Blessings for a defiled people. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, 
if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Did you want me to keep going? Well, I just was stop there. Um, okay. That's good for, for a moment. Just just to 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 point out some things um, is very interesting. In verse uh, the question that he asks, <clears throat> verse twelve: If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priest said no. So just because something that you have on you or have done, you touch something, does it become holy? You know, if something you have that you're holding touches something else, because no, it doesn't become holy. But he says, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, yes, it does become unclean unclean so so you can't have something and touch something with that that is holy and make it holy but you can touch something um that is clean with something that is unclean and make it unclean it's uh it's kind of like when you mix vanilla and chocolate ice cream together like you, you you put it in a bowl and you mix it all together you can't make it all white <laughs> no matter what you do it's always going to be that the you know the 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 that the vanilla can't make the dark the chocolate vanilla but the chocolate can make the vanilla more chocolate um the only thing here that can make something holy is god we can't make something holy by touching it with something else that's holy that um even though their acts and what they're doing is is holy that it's god who is making it holy not necessarily them um, but they can do things that are unclean in addition god is explaining that just like uh in the wilderness with moses um that the way that that they were kind of given uh um trials to go through uh so that they would come back to god and be more faithful to god so God has done here the same with them. And, and now that they've come back and they've built this temple, um, he's saying from, from this day on, I will bless you. I will bless you. Um, last part here, which is really important. Um, go ahead, Ruth. Okay. Zerubbabel chosen as a signet. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. 
This is, uh, this is profound, especially for these people who are waiting for the Messiah. Okay? This almost looks, this, this word from the Lord is coming, this message is from the Lord to go to Zerubbabel. And, and so um, he's saying that you have, uh, you have a, basically a, a place and an authority among me that is very special and that you are of the line of David and will continue on that line of David and, and bring that hope to the people. But he doesn't say necessarily that Zerubbabel is the Messiah, but he is, um, he's saying that, that that is, it's, it's of your line here now from David through you, um, that something great is going to be happening. And this is giving hope to all of Jerusalem, all of the people, because they don't want to be under the, the thumb of the Persians. They don't want to be there. And this is giving them hope that they will be independent again one day and that, and that God is in control. So... The book of the prophet Haggai. It's one of the smaller prophetic books, but crucially important in the overall story of the Hebrew Bible. So for centuries, the Hebrew prophets had been accusing Israel of breaking their covenant with God through idolatry and injustice, and they warned that God would send the great empire of Babylon to take out Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and haul off the people into exile. And it all happened in the year 587 BC. But that wasn't the end of the story. The prophets also believed that there was still hope and that God would one day bring back a transformed remnant of his people Israel to live in a new Jerusalem where God's presence would live in their midst. Now when we turn to Haggai, the year is 520 BC, nearly 70 years after the exile. And the Babylonian Empire has recently collapsed and the world is now ruled by the Persians. Now they allowed the return of any exiled Israelites who wanted to go back to Jerusalem which still lay in ruins. And so under the leadership of a high priest named Joshua and Zerubbabel, an heir from the line of David, and a group of exiles, they all returned and began to rebuild the city and their lives. Remember the story from the book of Ezra chapters 1 to 6. So our hopes are high and the future seems very bright, but it's not actually, at least from Haggai's point of view. The book consists of four sections that summarize Haggai's message given to the people of Jerusalem over the course of four months. He opens by accusing the people of misplaced priorities. And so yes, they have come back to Jerusalem, but they're spending all of their time and resources rebuilding their own fancy houses, while the temple still lay in ruins from its destruction from 70 years ago. So Haggai asks, are your own houses really more important than your allegiance to God? This neglect, Haggai says, is tantamount to the covenant rebellion of their ancestors, which is why the land is still unproductive, why they've been struck with famine and drought. And here Haggai's quoting from the list of covenant curses in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Haggai's challenging words, they're followed by a story of the people's response. Remember also the story in Ezra chapter 5. We're told that Zerubbabel, Joshua, the remnant of the people were provoked by Haggai's message and they were motivated. They started rebuilding the temple. So in the next section, Haggai follows up one month later and he addresses some problems of shattered expectations among the people. So the temple that they're rebuilding is really pretty unimpressive. It's nothing compared to the glory of the temple Solomon built here some 500 years earlier. And so morale was really low for finishing the project. And so Haggai reminds the people of the great prophetic promises of the future kingdom of God and about this temple. He draws from the earlier prophets, especially Isaiah and Micah, about the new Jerusalem and that it would be the place from which God would redeem the whole world and where all nations would come and participate in God's kingdom resulting in an era of peace. And so the temple, it plays a key role in God's plans for the future. And Haggai calls on the people to work in hope despite the disappointing circumstances. In the third section, Haggai follows up two months later with a call to covenant faithfulness. And he engages some priests in a conversation about ritual purity. Remember all the key ideas from the book of Leviticus. So he says, if someone goes and touches a dead body and becomes ritually impure or marked by death, and then they go and touch some food, is that food impure too? And the priests, knowing the book of Leviticus, say, yes, it's impure. 
And then Haggai turns this into a parable. He says, this is how it is with the people of Israel and what they're putting their hands to in rebuilding the temple. If the current generation doesn't humble themselves, if they don't turn from injustice and apathy, then Haggai says whatever they build with their hands, including this new temple, will be impure too. Haggai's challenge is that it's only by true repentance and covenant faithfulness that their building efforts will result in God bringing his kingdom and blessing. And so in a sense, Israel's future lay in their hands. God's waiting for his people to be faithful. And so the choice that Haggai's laying before the exiled generation, it's very similar to the challenge Moses gave the wilderness generation before entering the land. Their obedience will lead to blessing and success while faithlessness will lead to ruin. The book concludes with Haggai's summary of the future hope of God's kingdom. He's going to make the new Jerusalem the center of his glorious international kingdom. And from there, he will confront and defeat evil among the nations. He reminds people of the defeat of Pharaoh's army in the Exodus story. God will fulfill here his promise to David and establish the king from his line. And in Haggai's day, that was represented by Zerubbabel. And so the book ends with the choice of a bright future just hanging there. So the question is, will Haggai's generation be faithful to God? Will they experience the fulfillment of all these promises? And Zerubbabel, will he be faithful? Will he turn out to be the messianic king? And you have to just keep reading into the final two books of the prophets, Zechariah and Malachi, to find out. But you can see how this little book contains a great challenge to every generation of God's people, that our choices really matter, and that the faithfulness and obedience of God's people is part of how God has chosen to work out his purposes in the world. And so this surprising truth should motivate humility and action in God's people as they look forward to God's coming kingdom. And that is the message of the book of Haggai. All right, were you able to see that? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. That really was. You know, it summarized everything, I think, really well, having gone through it and learning about it and your teaching and the Bible and then the way that that video was done was really excellent. It, it is, the Bible Project is a wonderful, wonderful resource that gives you, that can give you overviews and talk about specific themes in the Bible. Um, and you can read through the whole Bible with it. And it it, it helps you, it helps keep you from being intimidated by what you're reading and gives you uh, uh, more information so that you, you can read confidently about what's going on. Yeah, and I like how they didn't have it all there, like they were writing it as they were going, so you didn't have to try to decipher each um, little cell, you know. Yeah. It gave you a certain amount of information to work through at a time. That was good. That was good, but I think what made, what made it good for me, uh, Julian, is that you had explained it all mm-hmm. in depth before, uh, because it, the, the video right. is, is excellent, but it really it takes the major themes, and had you not explained it, I don't think I would have gotten as much from it. So, Thank you. Um, let's uh, move on into PowerPoint. The, this is... Uh, what they this is the the image that they had in the video um, that they drew out. Um, I'm not going to go too much through it, but uh, with that whole t- touching something impure and then touching something else, and that also becomes impure. Um, that theme of uh, you know, even though God is the one who blesses and brings holiness, um, but if they're impure, touching something, they're making it impure, and if their hearts were impure and they were going and building the temple that that could make the temple impure in some, in some aspect. Oh. Um, milestones for Haggai. Um, some things that, to consider. Misplaced priorities. The book of Haggai reminds the exiled rebuilders of Jerusalem to give God their primary allegiance and not rebel against the, cov- the covenant like their ancestors did. You know, this, it seems that as you go throughout scripture, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Do not rebel like your ancestors. Do not rebel like your ancestors. And, and yet that seems to be a reoccurring theme. That that's the reason why they, they were in exile in the first place. 
you know, in exile, you have all these prophetic readings, um, write, writings of what's going on. And it's believed that the first and second Chronicles was written during the exile um, to, to commemorate the, the glory days of Israel and David. And yet, here they are. They're finally given something. They're put back in the land, and they're told to rebuild the temple, even though uh, they're still ruled by Persia, but they're allowed back in the land and, and to govern themselves in some, in some aspect and, uh, and build the temple. They, they're not doing it. So, so <laughs> it's like your kid's apologizing for something that they did, and then all of a sudden they're kind of doing it again. <laughs> It's like, hey, come on, let's do this. You wanted this back, you got it back. Let's start to 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 do something. Um, so misplaced priorities, shattered expectations. The people felt discouraged because the temple looked unimpressive, but Haggai reminded them to keep working and hope in God's promise of the new Jerusalem. Um, and the new Jerusalem, as we know, uh, as Christians looking forward that new Jerusalem is coming again in the future, uh, co coming from heaven, and, uh, and Jesus is, is, is all involved with that. This is happening way in the future, um, well, hopefully sooner than later. Um, you know, if you want the end times to come quicker so that the new Jerusalem's here sooner, but this is uh, not necessarily something that's going to be built by their hands during this period of time. It's something that, that, uh, that we know that's coming in the future when Jesus returns. And then the new covenant call. Uh, ritual purity in Leviticus, uh, just like that, the current Jerusalem inhabitants must humble themselves and reject injustice and apathy where their building efforts would also be impure. Um, that the, they rejected injustice and they were apathetic. They were way more concerned about their homes. Um, and they weren't happy that what they got was enough. And then remain faithful. Haggai challenged the exiled generation as uh, Moses challenged the wilderness generation. They could choose their future. Obedience and covenant faithfulness brought success and God's blessing to them. And then hope in God's kingdom. These are the uh, milestones. So hope in God's kingdom. Um, God will fulfill his promise to establish a new Jerusalem the center of his international kingdom, and he will defeat evil from among the nations. That is coming. That, that will be here, um, and we have to wait for it. Um, summing up Haggai, Haggai delivers a convicting message to the Israelites, which reprimands them for living in lavish homes while the Lord's temple remained in ruins and proclaims a curse from God upon their land, so as long as the temple was left in a state of rubble. Haggai's message is delivered in order to call the people back to prioritizing the Lord. He is effective in this regard and offers encouragement to the people from the Lord for their positive response to the message. You know, a lot of times we'll see God giving a message and the people ignore it. And in this case, they didn't. And despite uh, the commitment from the people to rebuild the temple, they became disappointed that the new temple paled in comparison to the first. Haggai, again, seeks to call the people back to prioritizing the Lord. And this time in their trust by explaining that the only difference between the temples was their glory and that only the Lord could provide this resource. The Lord confirms this assertion by proclaiming that a new temple will surpass the old in its glory. The Lord offers further encouragement for the people to remain faithful to him 
by reconfirming the Davidic covenant with them and affirming their leader Zerubbabel as the Davidic successor that will lead his people while he reestablishes his kingdom. So that's uh, um, the governor Zerubbabel, who was made governor because of his stature um, and the fact that he is of that Davidic uh, bloodline, that he will be the signet ring. And, uh, and God wants to reestablish his kingdom, and he's going to be using Zerubbabel to do this. So this is encouragement and hope for the people. I just wanted to look at this. Um, I thought this was a fantastic quote regarding, uh, regarding the heart of Haggai and, and relevant for us right now as we're reading it. Um, Janet, could you, could you read this for us? Sure. May God strengthen us to place kingdom activity in its proper perspective. The Israelite community in the Persian period was a community dwarfed by the power of the Persian Empire. And today, as we live in an increasingly secularized world, we may be tempted as the church to cower in submission to live in fear but we have even greater reasons to expect the cataclysmic upheaval of the cosmos. For the Zerubbabel who was, who was to come and, for the Zerubbabel who was to come has come and through his resurrection confirms the promise of old. Haggai calls us to embrace that cataclysm as our hope and to live faithfully until Zerubbabel's greatest son, our Lord Jesus Christ returns. We can be overwhelmed um, right now. I think a lot of us are overwhelmed with what's going on uh, with the pandemic, but we can be overwhelmed by the constant encroachment of secularism and the ungodly and, and become discouraged. But we have every reason to be encouraged, no matter how small or how large the church is, because of Jesus Christ and what he's done, and what he's promised, and, um, and he is going to return, and we have that hope with us at all times. So my final thoughts uh, for studying this, um, number one, do not neglect God for your selfish tendencies. Instead, serve him and build his kingdom here by carrying out God's mission as Jesus commanded in John 20, 21. Just as the Father sent, G sent Jesus, so Jesus has sent the disciples, the disciples, and us. And uh, we're supposed to go into the world and, and continue to carry forth his mission of reconciliation um, and redemption and restoration. And that's the... The restoration is what we see going on in this uh, story, the physical restoration of Israel, but especially God's temple. And then God provides hope for the future for those who live within his will.